I'm sorry, I realized nobody could hear me. Um, I was just saying we'll start promptly at um, 6.30. We're just waiting for a few more folks to, um, to log on. I'm starting in the next minute. Okay, I think, I think we'll begin. Um, are we all ready? Great. Um, I just wanted to um, say thank you for all, to all of you for uh, joining us this evening. My name is Allison O'Hara. I am the Executive Director for One in 40. Um, thank you again for taking the time to learn more about um, the One in 40 risk, hereditary cancers, as well as learning more about um, One in 40. We have allotted about one hour for this evening's program. We hope you can um, join us for the entire session. If not, a recording uh, will be made available on our website. Um, also, a few of you have um, submitted some questions, so we'll get to those to evening, this evening. If you should have any additional questions, uh, feel free um, in the Q&A or in the chat portion of your screen to send, send me a message and I will help to answer those during tonight's webinar and um, put them out to our panelists. I also wanted to set, extend a special thank you. Um, this uh, webinar is brought to you, brought to us in partnership with uh, Temple Amuna and Temple Isaiah of Lexington, uh, Massachusetts. I also wanted to extend a thank you. We have a great lineup of speakers this evening. Dr. Judy Garber from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Jill Stoffer from Dana-Farber, and also um, one of our 1 in 40 storytellers, Sandy Lamon, and then as well as uh, Rabbi David Lerner. Um, I wanted to, before we kind of get started, um, I just wanted to briefly thank our sponsors this evening that made tonight's webinar possible. The Allergan Foundation, GlaxoSmithKline, Pfizer, Clovis Oncology, uh, Goldstein and Bilodeau, and New England Development. So just a little bit more about um, why one in 40 and, you know, more about our organization. Um, in 2016, our founder, Lauren Kordak, um, who recently lost her life to stage four ovarian cancer in late December uh, 2020, um, sought genetic testing and counseling. Um, the screening had shown that Lauren had um, inherited a mutation in her BRCA gene that put her at much higher risk than the general population of developing breast and ovarian cancer. Um, given uh, Lauren's family history and her Ashkenazi Jewish, Jewish heritage, she should have been referred to um, a genetic counselor and screened um, for the BRCA gene mutations many years ago. We are um, dedicated to um, continuing the life-saving work that Lauren had started um, through raising awareness of the 1 in 40 risk um, to Ashkenazi Jews of inheriting a BRCA gene mutation um, by providing support and um, helping families effectively um, manage their cancer risk. I would now like to introduce uh, Rabbi David Lerner. Since 2004, uh, Rabbi David Lerner has served as the spiritual leader of Temple Amuna uh, in Lexington, where he is now the senior rabbi. He brings um, to his community a unique blend of warmth, outreach, energetic teaching, 
inte intellectual rigor and caring for all ages. So please join me in welcoming uh, Rabbi Lerner. Rabbi. Thank you so much, Allison. You're welcome. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I'm honored to be a part of this uh, distinguished panel and to uh, host this event with Temple Isaiah and with One in 40. And I thank you for bringing this program to our communities. Tonight, we're going to touch on three critical aspects of, of Judaism. The first one is knowledge. We are taught to study Torah and Torah includes, and most especially includes, medical knowledge, which can save our lives or the lives of others. We're also taught the second goal this evening, which is to save a life. The Mishnah says famously, if you save a life, it's as if you have saved the world. And during this year of this terrible pandemic, when so many of us and so many on this planet have lost loved ones, we know what a difference it can make to save a life. Third, the mitzvah of Bikur Cholim, of visiting the six. God models this in the Torah when God visits Abraham, when Abraham is recovering. And this is a primary value. So to tonight, we learn how to share information to care for those who are or may become ill. The fourth value that I wanted to touch on is community. We are here this evening and when we're, whether we are in person or through Zoom, we're here to strengthen one another. And in Judaism, the notion of a community is absolutely paramount. Our rabbis understood that removing yourself from the community was actually dangerous. The support of others is so valuable that it can literally save our lives. And so this evening, we gather to learn with and from each other and to support one another and to share what we learn with others in community. Finally, I wanted to end with a verse from the Tanakh, from the Hebrew Bible, which the Psalms have many verses that are a source of strength and inspiration and help us through difficult times, especially when we're dealing with illness. Um, Psalm 147 reads, It understands God as a healer of broken hearts and one who binds their wounds. Now, in my understanding, we are God's hands in this world. Doctors, nurses, scientists, caregivers of all kinds are God's hands. And so this evening, let us be God's hands to take this learning in, to heal the brokenhearted, binding them with our love and strengthening one another. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, I would now like to turn the program over to um, Jill Stoffer. Uh, Jill is the Associate Director for Cancer Genetics and Prevention at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Um, she also counsels individuals and families um, with hereditary risk to cancers and works on a number of research projects um, in um, regards to genetic counseling. In addition, also Jill serves on 1 in 40's Medical Advisory Board. Jill, I, um, I'll stop sharing my screen too and turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thanks so much for mm -hmm. That going to pull. All right, let me get this going here. Okay. Uh, so thank you all for inviting me here today to talk about genetic testing, uh, what I call embracing knowledge and empowering choices. I think uh, many people in the Jewish community at this point have heard about genetic testing. And for some, it, it's attractive immediately and, and people really wanna go do it. And for others, it's, it's scary. Um, and it's something that it can be hard to really think about actually doing. And what I say is that there really has to be a reason to what I call look behind the curtain and see you know, if there's something scary going on. Uh, there has to be some benefit to doing it. And what I would like to make clear in my part of the presentation is the sort of the foundation for 
why would you peek behind the curtain? Why would we uh, learn this information about ourselves, information that could potentially be frightening or information that might affect our loved ones in a way? And it's because there are things to do about this. There are things to do. There are ways to make things better. Um, embracing this knowledge really does lead to empowering choices. And you'll hear a lot more uh, when Dr. Garber presents uh, her section of the presentation as well. So I do want to say that uh, knowing Lauren Kordak was really inspiring. Um, and I'll never forget talking to Lauren when I told her about the one in 40 chance that if you are of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, Eastern European Jewish ancestry, that you could have this sort of inherited genetic risk for breast and ovarian cancer. And she just looked at me and she said, one in 40, one in 40, really? It's that common? And it, it just launched her on this crusade. It wasn't just me, obviously. It was the, the fact that she learned that this was so common in the Jewish community and that she did have a family history of cancer and that maybe things could have been different. And she launched with great energy and zest into making this her mission so that other people would not have to face some of the things that she faced because there are things to do about this. There are ways to make things better. So what I wanted to do in my section is go through a little bit of what we call genetics one-on-one, -on -one. very, very brief overview of uh, genes and uh, what is hereditary cancer risk? What are some clues about when do we suspect it might be present? The link between the BRCA genes or the BRCA1 and 2 genes and Jewish ancestry, a little bit about what does it mean when someone has an inherited gene alteration or mutation in a BRCA gene, and then just a little bit about how do people get tested, including now in times of COVID. So here's my genetics 101. Um, I think uh, the first thing to clarify is in terms of genes, we all have cancer risk genes. Uh, we all have genes that could potentially predispose us to developing cancer and of course other conditions as well. And so what a gene is, is it's just a segment of DNA. And here in my slide, I have uh, the chromosome sort of unwound. You can almost think of uh, the, the chromosome like a big knotted telephone cord. Those of us old enough to remember a telephone cord when, when those things existed. <laughs> If you stretch it out, that's kind of what a DNA molecule is like. So a, a gene is just a stretch of DNA. It's a segment of DNA, and it's spelled with uh, DNA letters, a genetic code. So we all have genes that can predispose us to cancer. And what we hope is that our genes are in good working order and that they're able to do their jobs. So when a gene is literally spelled correctly, when the genetic code is, is intact, a gene is a blueprint for a protein. It's a recipe for a protein. So when the genes are functional, you get these proteins produced and they protect you and they help you from avoiding things like a cancer diagnosis. If you have a gene that is like a, a BRCA gene and it's not in working order, you may not get uh, a protein that is able to do its job, and that's what leads to the vulnerability to develop certain forms of cancer. So when we do genetic testing, I call it literally spell checking. We're spell checking the genetic code. And here I have two uh, cartoons of uh, two genes and literally what it's like to spell check. So here I just have two words theater, and then obviously a misspelling of theater. Um, and if you go letter by letter through the genetic code and you see that there are letters that shouldn't be in the position where you try to read the spelling on the right uh, cartoon and it, it doesn't mean anything, T-H-X-Q-T-E-R, it, it doesn't mean anything. And so this is a misspelling. Uh, we call these mutations, alterations in the genetic code. Uh, sometimes the technical word we use is pathogenic variant, but essentially what it is is a misspelling. It's a misspelling that pre prevents the gene from doing its job and can lead to vulnerability uh, to develop cancer. And when we do genetic testing, this is the type of thing we do. So we know that, um, I 
I got exuberant with my mouse there and advanced too quickly. Here we go. Okay. Um, and so we know in the Jewish population, especially in the Eastern European Jewish population, the Ashkenazi population, that there is common shared genetic ancestry. We have common shared uh, ancestors. And so there are common shared gene alterations as well. And so there are three specific misspellings that we see. Two of them are in the BRCA1 gene. One of them is in the BRCA2 gene. And so you can see here this uh, older designation 187 del EG. It's really a location. It, it tells you where in the gene is the misspelling. And if someone is of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, then should there be a mutation in BRCA1 or 2, there's a 90% chance it's going to be this one, this one, or this one. Now, we know that this is not the only type of genetic risk we can see in the Ashkenazi Jewish community. And so rarely now do we limit our genetic testing to only these three locations in these two genes. But these are the things that lead to that very much increased chance of finding genetic risk due to BRCA2 among the Ashkenazi Jews, because in the general population of everyone else, so people of Asian ancestry or other European ancestry, African ancestry, it's like one in 300 or one in 400 people might have this type of genetic risk. And so that compared to one in 40 is really quite different. And now when we uh, meet with folks, uh, we try to think about what is the best, uh, most comprehensive, reasonable test for someone. And typically we go beyond this because we know that the BRCA1 and 2 genes are not the only genes that can increase breast, ovarian, and other cancer risk. But these are the, one, these are the findings that are more common. And why are they more common? What, why? why? Why is it that we see this one in 40? And it, it's something called a founder effect. It's something that when you have a small population of individuals who tend to have children among themselves, you can find something get overrepresented when that population size shrinks down to a, a small number of individuals. And so we think that in the Middle Ages in Central Europe, the number of Jews were very small in number, numbering in the thousands. And if you have you know, just one or a few more cases in a very small population, all the descendants of that small population will also see the same genetic effect overrepresented. Um, and so the Jewish community uh, historically has been more insular in terms of having children among themselves. And so this is why we see this increased chance of seeing these specific uh, gene mutations. And so, you know, the maybe one thing that can be, um, you know, interesting to know is if someone is discovered to have one of these gene alterations, it, it did not start with you. It's probably been in your family for thousands of years. Some of these are pre-diaspora mutations. And so it's been a long chain of events that led it to the current generation, perhaps. But knowing about it is where all the power uh, comes in, knowing about it. Um, I do want to add that this type of genetic risk overall is not that common. Of all cancers in general, about 10% overall is hereditary. Um, but there are some clues that let us know when it's more or less likely to be the case. And so when we meet with folks who are uh, interested in going through the, the chances that you know, they, they may have hereditary risk, we look for these features. Is there, first of all, just overall more cancer than we would expect in the family than we would expect to see just due to chance alone? We know cancer is pretty common, uh, but we kind of ask ourselves that as a starting question. Are there multiple people in the family with the same or related types of cancers? Are these cancers presenting themselves at earlier than typical ages, depending on you know, what is the typical age that cancer uh, usually uh, presents itself? So for breast cancer, that's usually under the age of 50, as an example. 
Are there less, co less common types of cancer in a family? Um, while 12 to 13% of women may develop breast cancer, ovarian cancer is less common. Only about one to 2% of women will develop ovarian cancer. And so seeing several women in the same family with ovarian cancer is very, very suggestive of hereditary risk. Uh, seeing it in combination with pancreatic cancer, uh, advanced prostate cancer, male breast cancer, these are all clues. Uh, someone in the family who themselves has more than one type of cancer is suggestive of hereditary risk. Um, and we've already talked about the uh, Jewish ancestry part. So why no? Uh, what, what, what kind of information does one learn? And one of the things that's immediately evident is that the chance to develop cancer over one's lifetime is very different. The average risk uh, person here, the average risk is on the, the right most column. And you can see that the risk for female breast cancer, 50 to 80% approximately compared to the average person, that's a really big increase. Developing a second primary cancer is also a consideration, even for people who are already diagnosed with breast cancer, having this information may affect other uh, decisions. Ovarian cancer risk is increased with these genes, uh, melanoma, pancreas, male breast cancer, prostate. So uh, BRCA1 and 2 are like many of the cancer risk genes that we know about, where there's a short list of different cancers for which your chances would be elevated. It's not just breast cancer or just ovarian cancer. There's a profile that each gene has. Um, and I also want to emphasize that men are affected by uh, BRCA genes and other cancer risk genes, just as women are. There was a prominent study that was published recently looking at the incidence of uh, gene mutations in men with high risk or advanced prostate cancer. And overall, we found about almost 12% of men had some sort of inherited genetic risk. So this is not just a woman's issue, this is for men and women. And again, there are things to do about it. And things to do about it may be starting screening at an earlier age than what would otherwise happen. It may mean including different types of testing. So the average woman, for example, is not getting breast MRI at all, not for screening purposes. Um, but that is something that we start at an early age. Uh, there are special screening for men. And I know Dr. Garber is gonna go through this in more detail. Uh, there are ways to address risk with preventive surgery, uh, removing healthy tissue as, as a hedge to dramatically lower cancer risk. Um, and there are some medicines to take that can also lower cancer risk. There are uh, a number that are available now and there'll be more down the road. So getting tested, there are a number of different ways to do it. You know, obviously we're here from Dana-Farber and so we're happy to assist anyone who's interested in this. Uh, but there is a national organization one can check. The National Society of Genetic Counselors has a website with a search tool. Your relatives, no matter where they live in the country, can find local uh, referrals. Talking to your own doctor or nurse is a great place to start as well. And then there are certain online companies that are offering genetic testing. So it's never been more accessible. Um, and the way we're doing genetic testing now in times of COVID is we're sending people saliva kits in the mail directly to their homes. And this literally involves spitting in a tube and sending the genetic, the, sending the DNA in that way. Uh, and so anyone who's done ancestry uh, testing, it's the same thing, it's that same tube that you get in the mail. And so we are supportive of people thinking about population screening for the Ashkenazi Jewish community for alterations in the BRCA genes because there's an opportunity to make a difference. There's a chance to reduce the number of cancer diagnoses. There are ways to stratify who needs this extra screening and just as importantly, who doesn't because even if this risk is in the family, not everyone will have it. If a parent has it, there's a 50-50 chance. And so those who have it can get the right screening and follow up. Uh, and those who don't, do not need to have those extra things done. Uh, and so I think that is, yes. I'm gonna stop there and turn it over to Dr. Garber.
Thank you, Joe. Up. We've had a, um, a few questions come in, but we'll save those. Um, I just wanted to let folks know we'll save those um, when we um, conclude after Sandy shares her story. Um, I would now like to turn it over to Dr. Gar Gar Dr. Garber and just introduce her quickly. Um, Dr. Garber is um, the chief of the Division of Cancer Genetic and Prevention at uh, Dana Farber Cancer Institute. She's also a professor of medicine at Harvard Med Medical School. Um, she conducts research in clinical cancer genetics with a special focus in the genetics of breast cancer. And she also serves um, on 140's Medical Advisory Board. Dr. Garber. Thank you, Allison. You're welcome. And after hearing uh, the rabbi's wonderful opening remarks and Jill's lovely presentation, I'm was asked to try to address a few more questions. So here comes the why be tested again. Maybe this is the physician's perspective and what would you do with this information? So I too wanted to remember Lauren uh, because uh, obviously we're here because of her and because her passion was so contagious uh, and made you really think about how to try and help in her quest to alert the community about the one in 40 risk. So one in 40 is two and a half percent. And for a genetic condition, that's pretty common. And Jill mentioned that the rest of the population's chance of having a mutation anywhere in the BRCA1 or two genes is about one in 400. So it really is 10 times more common in individuals of Jewish descent and common two and a half percent. So here are the questions that Allison assigned to me. What, why would you look and what would you want to know? So reasons to be tested for the BRCA gene mutations, the medical rationale for enhanced screening and preventive measures. And then, and this is Allison's word, but I like it anyway, the panoply of treatment measures at, at your disposal should a cancer develop. So I thought about this. Why would you want to be tested to see if you had a BRCA1 or 2 mutation? And of course, the main reason is to learn that you don't have one. Uh, because of course you'd rather not have one of these and learning you are negative does not tell you that you'll never get cancer. Unfortunately, most cancer is really not because of these genes, even in people of Jewish descent, but it's always better to be negative for a high risk marker. And it is a good thing to learn that you're negative. If you have cancer in the family, you may be interested in trying to explain why did that cancer cluster? I have a breast cancer family history we've never explained, um, but we certainly look to see if BRCA1 and 2 were part of the reason because it would have affected not only my care, but the care of my cousins and my children, perhaps down the road. Another reason might be to learn uh, whether you have risk if you don't know much about your family. Many Jewish families are small. Some Jewish families are really mostly men. Very few women uh, may be you know, brothers, cousins, fathers. It may seem that cousin, the family has few women. If there are few women, there's less opportunity to see ovarian cancer as Lauren had or breast cancer. And I think to realize that families can inherit risk through the father as well. That was Lauren's story that she didn't realize that she had risk because it wasn't on her mother's side. And we've learned more about genetics. So we recognize that this risk can come from the father. In fact, and I, I don't say this because men are not sensitive to this, but people aren't thinking about their risk when they recognize something that looks like, oh, it, it affects the women in the family. And especially if there aren't many women. So in many studies, it's been shown that if you check the population, you'll find more carriers among men. They never realize they should look, but they should look. Um, another question is, you know, to be tested if a relative turns is tested and found to be positive. Of course, you want to make sure it's relative with whom you share a bloodline, not just someone who's married in. But um, but if if they're if you're contacted by a relative who says, you know. I got tested and I have this, you may want to know if you share it as well, your chance will be higher than the average person, even the average person of Jewish descent. If you have cancer, it is sometimes useful to find out that your cancer may have developed because of a BRCA1 or two mutation. Now we're gonna talk mostly about 
breast, ovarian, pancreas, and prostate cancer. Jill had a list that was a little longer and included some melanoma. But today where many cancers are characterized molecularly, you can see whether there is a contribution from BRCA1 or 2. And if there is, that may influence the treatment options um, available today and extend, extend them, which is a good thing for many of these more difficult diagnoses. So from a medical point of view, why would you ever want to know that you carry an altered BRCA1 or 2 gene? And as Jill suggested, one would be to start monitoring for cancers at earlier ages. So you'd have a chance to identify them early. And earlier cancers at diagnosis are still more curable than advanced disease. The other would be to consider risk-reducing options. So these are not always things you want to do, but given the range of risk that Jill presented, sometimes risk-reducing surgery can be the best option. There are others that we'll talk about. And then, of course, there is the possibility of learning that you carry one of these alterations. You may not want to pass this to the next generation. Now, this is a complicated ethical issue that maybe we should ask the rabbi to talk about and certainly a very individual decision, but it is technically possible to have children and not pass on certain altered genes. These genes are in that list. And I put at the bottom the, breast, the BRCA related cancers that we'll talk about just to remember that those are the focus tonight, though there may sometimes be others. So, We'll talk about screening. I'd have been here sooner if it hadn't been for early detection. Early detection works. It's not prevention, but it certainly can change outcome. So what kind of screening do we recommend for individuals who are found to carry an altered BRCA1 or 2 gene? So in the breast cancer world, we start young. So we do mammograms on everybody beginning at 45 or 50, depending on which set of guidelines you adhere to, but among our patients with BRCA1 or two mutations, we start at 25. We start with an MRI because it doesn't have radiation and because it's more sensitive and because it can see even in the presence of dense breast tissue that is detected on mammogram. MRIs don't care about density. And that's just a picture next to the text showing on the left, I think I can do this, let's see. No. Nope, uh, there it is. Uh, this is the mammogram where things are dense and um, next to it, the MRI where you can maybe, I don't know if you can see the arrow. Anyway, where in the red circle is that breast cancer that would have been missed otherwise. We do add mammograms at 30 and we wait till 30 to avoid radiating young breast tissue just in case it can contribute to cancer development. Um, and then women alternate having some screening every six months. And I realize I didn't even put the breast exams on here, but we recommend those as well. And I put investigational strategies. I think most people would agree that mammograms have limitations and that they are not a perfect screening test, nor are breast MRIs. Breast MRIs are more sensitive, but they're not as specific. So you can find a lot of small abnormalities, many of which won't be cancer, so there are more biopsies. Um, and that is its own anxiety and its own toll on people who commit to a long time of regular screening. There are technologies being studied to see if we can improve on breast imaging. And this is Boston, so we're surrounded by institutions that prioritize research as a way to make changes. And there are opportunities to participate in that. I think that would qualify for some of the rabbis um, and the, the, some of the, the um, benefit, not, that's not the word, but you know what I mean for, for uh, the mitzvahs that, that the Jewish community would recommend. Ovarian cancer screening is a huge problem. We know, as Lauren found, that most women are diagnosed with ovarian cancer at an advanced stage, excuse me, that it is difficult to detect it early. Ultrasounds are not great tools, blood tests, CA-125s, they really don't work well enough. There are investigational studies going on looking at better markers, circulating DNA, and uh, in this mighty study, um, a specific kind of RNA. Um, but this is a place where we really need progress. And it's not for lack of trying, but there really uh, is not a very good screening option for ovarian cancer. 
Pancreas cancer screening has become a question because of the risk, particularly in BRCA2. Screening is recommended not for all BRCA1 or 2 mutation carriers, but only for those at this time who have a mutation and a close relative with pancreatic cancer. And then screening is recommended to begin at 50 or 10 years younger than the age of the, the person in the family at their pancreatic cancer diagnosis. And that screening also is quite intense. Endoscopic ultrasound and MRI, MR, um, or MRCP. These are part of a series of studies called the CAP studies, which are trying to evaluate the advantages of screening. They have not shown that people live longer because they have screening, although they have shown that their cancers are diagnosed at an earlier stage, and there's some suggestion that they will live longer because of it. That is, after all, the definition of a successful screening test, that people live longer because of it, not just longer with the knowledge of the cancer. And prostate cancer screening, which remains a PSA and a digital rectal exam, but begins at 40 instead of 50. So for men who are at risk for being carriers of BRCA1 or 2 mutations, the main reasons to think about testing are for their prostate cancer risk, which is higher, their male breast cancer risk, which really is monitored only with a physical exam, and possibly for the reproductive decisions that could be affected by that information. The IMPACT trial is an international study trying to see whether PSA is the right blood test for prostate cancer in this population um, because the prostate cancers tend to be more aggressive. PSA is good at finding slow growing prostate cancers that plague most of the male population once they get to be a little bit older. Uh, but these tumors are more aggressive and it's not clear this is the best test. So here's the IMPACT trial at least looking at different options. So we can also try to reduce risk with surgery. And it's not that you really want to take away healthy tissue to avoid cancer, but you can, and you can with the, the, all of the work in this area, some women will end up looking like that woman in the middle, which is just a picture off the internet. It's not a patient that I know. Um, there are many improvements in the um, technology of, um, reconstruction. So it has made, I guess I should go back to that. It has made this a more appealing uh, procedure for women who may have to face this. Although it's hard to say there's ever a good time. The right time is before the cancer develops. And up here is just a graph showing that most people who decide on their own that they're ready for surgery are relieved by having the surgery and glad that they've done it. Although there are certainly trade-offs in sensation and I would never suggest that this was other than a major surgical procedure, but sometimes a necessary one. And this just shows how much prevention there is. Jill said, it's a reduction in the risk of cancer by 90%, which is not 100% if that was the requirement, but still quite good. Now, what do we do about preventing ovarian cancer? So removing the ovaries, if it's done when women are premenopausal, is going to make them menopausal is going to take away their female hormones. And I don't think anybody enjoys menopause, but it is particularly intense in younger women who have it surgically, not gradually as is the usual natural case. Um, so these are just two studies, which you won't be able to read, but are looking at the question, can you lower the risk of ovarian cancer by just removing the fallopian tubes and not removing the ovaries at all? This is from some work done originally at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, showing that uh, there are early cells in the fimbria of the fallopian tube, those finger-like projections at the end of the tube that sort of sweep the egg into the uterus for pregnancy. And it may be that that's where ovarian cancer really begins, and then it falls onto the surface of the ovary where ovarian cancer is known to reside. So these are two studies that have tried, that are asking the question, what if we take the tubes and delay taking the ovaries until closer to menopause? Nobody's gonna leave the ovaries in forever, but that question is such an important question because of the quality of life implications. And for women who choose to have these more abbreviated procedures early, um, I hope they will do it as part of a study so we'll learn whether this is the right answer or is not. Now, these are um, offered by gynecologists and GYN oncologists doing these surgeries today, hopefully as part of this research. As I said, 
Uh, these are done, it's more like having your tubes tied. They're laparoscopic procedures. They take about an hour. The surgery part of this done in experienced hands is the small part. The menopause is the challenge. And for many women, we do recommend hormone replacement. And, and there are many, uh, fortunately in Boston, who are quite expert at managing this for our patients who have to do this. This is just to tell you about a study that's coming to Boston, both to the Dana-Farber and Beth Israel. This is a study looking at denosumab, which you may know as a drug that's used for us, the treatment of osteoporosis. It targets a molecule called rank ligand, and that's its main job. It's, it's preventing osteoporosis or recovery from osteoporosis or used in cancer to help prevent bone metastases. But this drug has been um, found to target a molecule important in the development of BRCA1 related breast cancers. And there is an international study that's actually headed by Dr. Singer, who's in Austria, but Dr. Lindemann in Australia. And for me here in the US, we are going to look at whether this drug can help at least delay breast cancer. So women with BRCA1 mutations can at least defer that surgery um, that they are thinking about. So we'll let you know it's an international study in multiple countries, including Israel. Um, and it's uh, been a education. It's going to start this summer. So uh, just to let you know that that will become an option. Now, what about, uh, so I, I did not put in anything about preventing uh, at this time pancreatic cancer. I wish I knew how to do that. Prostate cancer, um, there have been some studies of selenium and um, some anti-hormones, none of which have been looked at in men with BRCA mutation. So we're still waiting to make a difference there. And we're not talking about prophylactic surgery for men at this time. So the last little bit I wanted to talk about was uh, treatment, because I do think that sometimes the silver lining of this is in people who have a cancer and find out that it did occur because of a BRCA mutation and that that gives them an extra treatment option that is not available to people who don't have the mutations. So these are these drugs called PARP inhibitors and these were developed uh, to work in people who have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. So what do BRCA1 and 2 do when they are working? Uh, they help cells repair errors in the DNA. So it turns out that if you have an inherited alteration in your BRCA, in one of your BRCA1 or 2 genes, the other copy works fine. And you know that because you've been able to develop and grow up and have children and do all the normal things with all of your cells working and you're not getting cancer every day. But the fact that you only have one working copy means that if any cell loses that copy for some reason, it's that much easier for cancer to develop. And that's why cancers occur at younger ages and why people often get more than one cancer when they've got that alteration. But their normal cells are generally doing quite well, thank you. However, in their tumors, they lose that second normal healthy copy of BRCA1 or 2, the matched pair, whichever it was. And the tumor is able to grow and not fix its errors in the DNA. The PARP inhibitors come in and they damage the DNA in a very special way that these tumors can't repair because they're missing that BRCA1 or 2, and that's what makes them vulnerable. In the normal cells that have some BRCA1 or 2 function, PARP inhibitors are not lethal. And we have used the, uh, the, bent, the legs on the bench <laughs> analogy. So if you usually have four legs in your normal cells and you lose one, the, tumor, the, the cell is really okay, can still stand up like this table, but if you're missing one to start with and something knocks out another leg, now the tumor, the, the, the table falls, the cell can't function. So what does it mean? So uh, this is just the last, almost the last slide to just say that PARP inhibitors have been shown now in BRCA1 carriers to improve outcomes in people with advanced prostate cancer, with pancreatic cancer, with ovarian cancer, in ovarian cancer, they actually do work in people who don't have mutations because of the very special biology of ovarian cancer, but they work better in people who do have mutations. And in breast cancer, after the tumor has come back, although there's some new data coming that suggests it will be effective at diagnosis as well. And there's also been some data to show, and these, we shouldn't try to read them, but just to say that these other genes that you 
know are out there beside BRCA1 and 2, some of them also confer sensitivity to these BRCA, uh, to these PARP inhibitors. Um, so that is another reason why the testing Jill mentioned goes beyond BRCA1 and 2 these days. So this was a trial I just wanted to mention because Lauren really helped us uh, try to recruit for this study and we did complete our accrual. This was a study that we did in Boston, California, Philadelphia and New York looking at testing in the Jewish population. And uh, Lauren was a huge help for us in trying to get the word out. So I thank her for the fact that we were able to complete this study and now we're doing the analysis. And this is just at Dana-Farber where we've put together a center for the BRCA genes and beyond the BRCA genes because some of them um, are connected to other cancers. That is it. Thank you, Dr. Garber. Um, I'd now like to turn over the program um, and welcome um, Sandy Lehman. Um, Sandy is a longtime friend of 1 in 40, and she's going to share um, her 1 in 40 story um, with us all this evening. Sandy, just make sure you unmute your, here you go. Okay, thank you, Allison. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to share my story. I think my story is sort of the classic case of uh, an old saying kind of turned upside down, and that is what you don't know can hurt you. Um, in 2012, my daughter Cheryl was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. She was 31 years old. She, um, I don't know if Allison, if you have the photograph, but um, at our at her bridal shower, the day the day after her bridal shower in August of of 2012, she was um, to go for a mammogram and it turned out that there was something that didn't look right. And she was immediately referred to an oncologist. There she is, that was at her bridal shower. Um, so we learned a month before her wedding that she had triple negative breast cancer and would be starting treatment pretty much immediately after her wedding. Um, this came totally out of the blue for us, uh, uh, the cancer, of course. But at the same time that they diagnosed her, they said, your daughter needs to be tested genetically because she was only 31, we're Ashkenazi, and I had literally no history of breast or ovarian cancer in my family or her father's family. So she was tested and she was BRCA2 or BRCA2 positive. Again, came out of the blue for us. Um, I was then tested first before her father was, and I turned out to be BRCA2 positive. Uh, I was really in shock. Uh, this was 2012. My mother had died in 1991 at the age of 62 of bile duct cancer. And I was told all along not to worry about it as anything to be inherited because it was such a rare cancer and you know, really left it at that. Uh, when I was 36, I had a baseline mammogram uh, something was found and I had a biopsy and it was nothing. So I, again, forgot about it. Uh, my dad's family, uh, basically uh, many of the people in his family had died in the Holocaust, but everybody who didn't die had lived very long lives. In fact, he lived to 94. He even had a great grandmother who lived to a hundred uh, and met and on both sides of his family, there was no cancer. Uh, my mother though was adopted. So that made a big difference in um, what I knew. I didn't know a lot about her family. And certainly in 1991, I knew nothing. 1997, again, this is 10, you know, a long time before my daughter was diagnosed, I found my mother's biological maternal family. And, my, and she happened to have been one of nine children, seven of whom were female. And I asked certainly about the family history, the medical history, and I was told no cancer. And in fact, my grandmother, my mother's biological mother had lived to the age of 86. She had a sister who ended up living to um, 105. And I think when I found the family, uh, her, um, in 1988, I knew that five of the sisters were still alive. When I found them in 1997, two of her sisters were still alive, my grandmother's sisters. So uh, the medical history on that side didn't concern me. And like so many people, 
I only thought about the maternal side. I didn't know anything about my mother's father, and it took me uh, several more years to identify that side of the family. So I did. Still didn't really know much about them. I knew about the family, but I didn't know anything about their medical history. And then literally um, a long time later, I learned who my mother's father was. But before that happened, my daughter died um, in 2015. She lived for three years and we still, you know, at that point didn't know. Uh, I actually had risk reducing surgeries uh, my daughter did too, as soon as uh, her cancer was diagnosed, of course, she had to have a double mastectomy at that point and uh, not a single, but a double. And she had her ovaries removed and I did the same thing. I was told, you know, I was extremely high risk. And then I was also told at that time that, hey, maybe your mother's cancer was actually related to the BRCA mutation. So, um, that was interesting to me, but again, still, I didn't have any history uh, that I knew of, of any of those cancers. Um, it wasn't until four years ago that I positively identified my mother's father. And this happened by finding my half first cousins, people who I shared the grandfather with um, through DNA testing. And I learned then that my biological grandfather had died at the same age as my mother, 62, in Sloan Kettering in New York City uh, 1961, when he was 62 years old, of something they described as stomach cancer. Nobody really remembers, knew him. The cousins were all very little and you know they don't have a lot of information, but that was enough information for me. Then I started to, of course, be able to have access to the family tree, uh, which one of the cousins had done pretty extensively. And when you look at it, you realize that there is a lot of early death in that family on that side. So I'm quite certain that uh, the BRCA mutation came from my mother's father. And it was something that I hadn't considered. And as well, you know, um, informed as I am, and I read everything, I used to be a medical writer. Uh, all of these things are important to me. And yet I didn't know anything about this. And neither did my physicians, which really disappointed me. Um, not to have ever been even suggested that I might, you know, try genetic testing since I knew so little about my family medical history. And by, you know, the early 2000s, they were really figuring out what cancers were associated. So now in order to um, protect myself besides the prophylactic surgeries, I do go for pancreatic cancer screenings. Every year I get an MRI. And, um, you know, so far so good. I'm working with a doctor at Columbia Presbyterian in New York on that. But I've been told that as I get older, my risk actually goes up for the cancer. So, you know, I am looking at that. And that seems to be the more prevalent cancer, at least that I know of. Um, I also identified a more distant cousin on that same side of the family who was BRCA2 positive and did have breast cancer. But again, it, uh, we, we didn't know at all and that she's not a direct relationship. So we haven't been able to really trace it. So since my daughter's diagnosis and, 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 her, and her passing, I've really felt and that it's really important to share this information and to be an advocate for genetic testing. I also agree um, that population-based testing is really important, especially for Ashkenazi Jews. But I think anyone who uh, is diagnosed early with cancer probably should look into it as well. I remember going to a meeting of another organization uh, focuses on, uh, on uh, hereditary cancer uh, force. And I was sitting at tables with women from all different ethnicities. I thought it would be um, a conference filled with just Jewish people, but it was people of all different ethnicities. And, you know, and they could also talk about not having known about cancer in their families or it having come through the, uh, the male side of their family. And, you know, unfortunately it does come as a surprise to most of us, but I agree that we really um, need to inform and be informed about, you know, our family histories. And if we're not, uh, to look for whatever other clues there might be that um, could guide us in the right direction. So I also agree, and what the rabbi said, that knowledge is absolutely power. Uh, we need to have the knowledge 
And if we save one life, we save the world. And that's also my mission. I met Lauren uh, when I was setting up another program that I did in my area here in New Jersey. And, um, and I said, I really believe in the mission of one in 40. Uh, it was, you know, it came along after my daughter, after we lost my daughter, but I believe in it and I certainly support it. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share my story tonight. Thank you, Sandy. And thank you, you know, for sharing your story, your daughter's story, and just being um, an advocate and a champion in the community. We, we really appreciate it. And thank you once again. Um, I wanted, you know, we have a few more moments left. Um, there have been um, a couple of questions that have come in through our Q&A. So I'm just going to quickly read those. And, um, you know, Dr. Garber or Jill, um, if something comes up for the rabbi or for Sandy, I'll let you know too. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll start, we just have a few quick questions. Um, so one of the, can you see the questions on the screen or no? Uh, no, you can't. Yes. Can you, the, you can see the questions mm -hmm. on the screen? Okay, um, I'm gonna stop stop the share then, just, just to keep that private. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so somebody had um, typed in um, that they had a, a BR, BRCA test years ago and um, when, the first, when the first test became available and the results were that she did, um, this person had no mutations of the ones they tested. But, you know, because of updates uh, with the testing, do you recommend, um, you know, for her to, for this person to get tested um, as of today? Jill, why don't you answer, but you're on mute. So yeah, this is a common um, situation now that someone presented years ago for genetic testing. And uh, you know, years ago, if the concern was uh, breast cancer or ovarian cancer, that was what was in our toolkit. The BRCA genes really were the focus of a lot of the testing that we did. And if the uh, family history has breast cancer or some other cancers that are suggestive of a pattern, then uh, we routinely see people back for updated testing. And that updated testing that we do is called panel testing, where because of advances in the way we do the testing in the lab, we can stack together on the same test a whole number of different genes and make it a very thorough, comprehensive test. And interestingly, testing is far less expensive now than it used to be. Back in the day, just getting the BRCA1 and 2 genes done could be quite expensive. And now we find that um, even if someone needs to pay out of pocket, it is generally capped out at about $250. So it's accessible, uh, even if insurance doesn't cover the cost because someone's already had genetic testing and that you know, box was checked. And so it's a great question. And uh, it's something that, again, we, we see people back quite often uh, to give it another go. If there was a reason to do testing in the first place and it didn't reveal anything, we know that our testing continues to improve more genes, better, more sensitive laboratory testing methods that it's, it's worth going back and, and checking uh, with our updated tests. Thank you. Um, this one might be for you too, Jill. Um, so somebody was diagnosed with breast cancer, their mother had it as well. Uh, rather than um, this person be tested, she's asking should her son, who is an only child, be tested um, for his children? What would, how would you respond to that? Yeah, another great question that comes up a lot. Uh, so it, it is common that someone thinks, well, I've already had cancer. Why do I need to be tested? I already know I'm someone with a cancer diagnosis. And yet um, the, the, the truth is that the person who has the cancer diagnosis can be the key member of the family to clarify for everyone else, what is the source of cancer risk in this family. Because we know sometimes we see families with more than their fair share, really looks like a pattern. We do our fanciest, biggest genetic test and we find nothing. We know that not all risk is detectable yet, um, but we also know that if you can 
nail down, oh, it's this gene, this is it. We, we have found the explanation. Then testing for everyone else becomes much, much more definitive. And so in a case where let's say a mom has had breast cancer and we test her and lo and behold, we find a gene alteration and we say, okay, now we know. And then the next generation gets tested and doesn't have it. That's what we call a true negative. We know why there's cancer in the family. We have resolved that question. We've solved that puzzle. We know why. And so the person who is in the next generation that didn't get it, that's truly a negative. Now, the other situation is if, uh, let's say the mom with breast cancer doesn't ever get tested and we only test the next generation that's cancer free and they're negative, we don't find anything. Well, you know, it's always good to be negative. That's always a nice result to see, but it's called an indeterminate negative because we're not sure in that situation, why the history of cancer is in the family. And there's always gonna be a little bit of uncertainty about what that means, um, even in the setting of a negative genetic test result because we don't have that certainty that we have tested the person for the right thing and that whatever the source of cancer risk is in the family is something that is detectable and will show up in our lab test. Thank you. Um, I know I'm aware. I'm aware of the time. We're, we're one minute over. I'm just going to end with this last question for Dr. Garber. Um, Rabbi Lerner had to drop off the call because he had um, he's he has to leave services. But just really quickly for um, for Judy um, or Dr. Garber. I'm sorry. Um, this per <laughs> uh, this person. She's 72. Um, she has the BRCA gene mutation. Just learned that she has ductal carcinoma in C2, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, with microinvasion. So she's asking, what is um, her risk of getting more cancer if she got a lumpectomy instead of a mastectomy? I don't know if you can answer that. Um, and then just really quickly, the other questions, we'll, um, we'll take this offline and I'll, I'll, I'll um, put those out to our panelists tonight and get back to everybody. Thank you, Judy. So that's a, a common question too. So here you are 72, you've had this gene all your life, but you didn't get cancer before. And now you have DCIS with um, a little bit of microinvasion. So everyone who has breast cancer and DCIS has some increased risk of getting cancer in the other breast. But the good news is that at 72, you've been living through your risk without getting cancer all this time. And the amount of risk that you have remaining, let's say you live another 20 or 25 years, is not 50 to 80%. It's much less. It's probably somewhere in the range of 15 to 20%. And that may not be enough reason for you to think about things like having bilateral mastectomies. So having a lumpectomy and radiation and possibly going on hormonal therapy that would help you to reduce the risk of this DCIS or the microinvasion spreading elsewhere or coming back would also likely reduce the risk of getting another breast cancer. So it is certainly possible at this point in your life to be able to have breast conserving treatment instead of mastectomies. Or you could decide that the anxiety of worrying about this uh, happening again would be enough to justify having the mastectomies, but many surgeons and medical oncologists would be quite supportive of your decision to do less rather than more, despite the mutation. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, um, you know, once again, thank our, our panel this evening. Thank you for the, all the medical information. Sandy, thank you once again for sharing your story. And thank you to Temple Amuna and Temple Isaiah for co-hosting this um, evening's program. Um, really quickly, if you, um, would like more information on the 1 in 40 risk, please visit the resources Jill outlined, as well as visit uh, 1in40.org. Any questions that weren't answered, I'll um, follow up with our panelists. And just everybody have a great evening. And thank you for joining us. I re we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having Dan me. For your thank story. You. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night.